there will come a time when a blue star will appear in the sky. Its light will shatter the darkness of the night. This blue star will bring a wind, a wind like that which has not been seen on Earth in a long time. The blue star will bring a fire. This fire will be so bright and hot that it will transform the matter of the universe. The blue light from this star is a signal that shall end the fourth world. The blue star will cause the oceans to rise and topple upon the land, flooding the world. All living things will perish in this great catastrophe. A people with no memory of the past are a people with amnesia. It may be that our planet's legends and myths are really a forgotten memory. A memory so terrible that amnesia may have been the only cure. Hello, I'm Johanna Lambert. Welcome to Earth Under Fire. Almost every culture preserves myths describing humanity's endurance of past events involving major loss of life on a global scale. Our ancestors tell us of endless days of darkness, of temperatures high enough to ignite wooded hills, of vast deluges covering all but a few mountain peaks. Today, we consider these stories as myths, legends, or highly imaginative tales. But could they be true? What if there really was a gigantic disaster? Is it possible that an ancient advanced civilization may have left a message for us about this catastrophe? Astrology was once considered an advanced science. Today, it is relegated to the fringes of our reality. Yet, there appears to be another side to astrology that only now, aided by the advancement of science, are we in a position to fully understand. Regardless of whether one believes that planetary energies shape human events, many may be surprised to learn that astrology's symbols convey a highly sophisticated astronomical and geological message. This message was first discovered by Dr. Paul Le Violette. In his most recent work, Earth Under Fire, he has utilized ancient celestial and astrological symbolism, as well as astrophysics, to decipher this message, which was evidently left by ancient astronomers for future generations. This message concerns a cosmological disaster, perhaps the worst to ever have afflicted the human race. A disaster which, according to Dr. Le Violette, was initiated by an explosion of our galactic core. Moreover, this ancient message warns that this tragedy could happen again, and indeed that it may occur at vast periodic intervals throughout the cosmic history of the Earth. Of the hundreds of millions of stars that make up our galaxy, those orbiting closest to its center congregate into a dense spherical mass called the nuclear bulge. Further out, stars orbiting the galactic center congregate into a number of gaseous star-studded spiral arms that extend tens of thousands of light years outward from the center bulge along its equatorial plane. From a great distance, our galactic homeland would look like an enormous glittering pinwheel. Our solar system is situated about 23,000 light years from the galactic center. Our sun and the earth lie at the fringe of one of its spiral arms. On a clear night, the stars forming the galaxy's spiral disk may be seen stretching across the heavens as a faintly luminous band of light known as the Milky Way. Although the outline of the galaxy's spiral arm is visible to the naked eye, the galactic center itself is hidden from view. The galactic center only becomes visible during a galactic core outburst. Even with the aid of optical telescopes, 
The center of the galaxy cannot be seen directly due to the dense clouds of cosmic dust that concentrate along the galaxy's equatorial plane. Even though we can't see the center of the galaxy, apparently the authors of the zodiac knew of its location. The signs for each of the 12 constellations have been around since ancient times. The glyphs for Scorpio and Sagittarius are the only ones among the zodiacal signs to incorporate arrows. And both are adjacent in sequence. When arranged to reflect the way these constellations actually appear in the sky, these two arrows or pointers are seen to face one another as if they were indicating some position in the sky. In fact, they appear to be intentionally pointing out the location of galactic center. It may, therefore, be far from coincidental that amongst the ancient characters assigned to play specific roles in the zodiac that the sign Sagittarius is portrayed as an archer. And he is aiming his arrow almost directly at galactic center. We also find that the tail of the scorpion is very near galactic center. In fact, two of the stars that make up the scorpion's tail, Lambda Scorpio and Upsilon Scorpio, are named Shala and Lisaf in Arabian star charts. Both of these mean the sting. When lines are added to connect these three tail stars with the galactic center, Scorpio takes on the shape of an upward arching arrow. Since the galactic center can at times release lethal outbursts of cosmic ray particles, such deadly symbolism is quite appropriate. However, the archer in Sagittarius is not pointing his arrow directly at the center of our galaxy. If we lead a trajectory in the direction that Sagittarius is presently aiming his arrow, we find that it misses the galactic center by 2.5 degrees of longitude. Using a computer-aided star map, we can see that there was a time when Sagittarius aimed his arrow much closer to the center of our galaxy. Looking at the position of these stars as they were in earlier times, we find that Sagittarius was aiming directly at the heart of the scorpion about 16,000 years ago, or about 14,000 BC. Such a precise indication of the galactic center's location is quite astounding. It isn't what we would usually attribute to the abilities of so-called Stone Age man. As we noted earlier, the galactic center's position is heavily obscured by interstellar dust and therefore is not directly visible with optical telescopes. Harlow Shapley, working with the 60-inch telescope at Mount Wilson above Los Angeles in 1917, determined the near position of the location of the center of the galaxy. He was off the mark by 3.3 degrees of arc. However, the ancient Sagittarius constellation indicates the galactic center location with an accuracy eight times better than Shapley's estimate. The Zodiac's message indicates that on this trajectory date, a galactic center energy creation event became visible and began to have a catastrophic effect on our planet, the Earth. Scientists found that the core of an active galaxy can shine brighter than the galaxy itself. That is, cosmic ray electrons streaking away from the galactic core close to the speed of light produce a bluish-white light so bright that it masks the light from the galaxy's spiral arms and surrounding massive stars. When in an active phase such as this, spiral galaxies are called Seyfert galaxies, named after their discoverer, Carl Seyfert. Astronomical surveys show that about one spiral galaxy out of every five to seven presently exhibits Seyfert-like characteristics. On photographic plates, however, the intensity of the outburst can be sufficiently subdued so that the galaxy's spiral arms can be distinguished, 
affirming that those luminous outbursts are indeed spiral galaxies in an active phase. Astronomers have come to realize that galactic core explosions occur in all spiral galaxies, even our own, and Although the majority of galaxies have a normal appearance with no sign of major core activity, they are simply galaxies whose cores happen to be in their quiescent phase. The statistics suggest that a galaxy core resides in the quiescent phase about 80 to 85 percent of the time. It spends the other 15 to 20 percent of its time in an active state with eruptive episodes lasting from hundreds to several thousands of years. There is abundant evidence that the core of our galaxy has undergone a major explosion episode comparable to those we observe taking place in safe earth galaxies throughout the universe. Dr. Paul Levierlet's research demonstrates that the zodiacal cryptogram may have been devised as an attempt to communicate to future generations the knowledge of this pervasive galactical cycle. In light of Dr. Levielet's work, we were able to ask ourselves some astounding questions, such as, were the ancients who intuited the symbolic content of celestial and zodiacal patterns attempting to tell us something? Many believe that ancient peoples were ignorant of the past and of the truth. But what if their myths are a warning to the people of the future about an event, a great catastrophe that occurred a long time ago? What if the memory of this event shaped the lives and thoughts of all those who came after it? What if this memory is the real significance behind humanity's many mythologies? The Hopi people of North America have a legend that there were three other worlds before this, the present world. Each of these worlds was terminated by a great catastrophe. The Hopi believe that this ending will be heralded by the appearance of Sakwasoha, the blue star spirit. Sakwasoha will shine brighter than all of the stars in the heavens. These legends promise that one day, the present world will also come to an end. And although the Blue Star Spirit brings forth the end of this world, she also plants the seeds for the next one. Since the cores of distant exploding galaxies are observed to have a bright blue-white star-like appearance, it is reasonable to expect that the core of our own galaxy would have a similar appearance during its explosive stage. The legendary appearance of a blue star could be referring to an explosion of our galaxy's core. Since we cannot see the galactic core because of intervening dust clouds, most of the blue light that ancient viewers would have seen from a galactic core explosion would have come from the cosmic ray electrons emitted from the core. During their 23,000 light year journey to us, this advancing army of torchbearers would have been continuously generating and beaming forward a bluish light. It would have appeared suddenly, without warning, and would have remained in the sky for several hundred to several thousand years. During this ancient galactic superwave passage, the star-studded sky that we are used to seeing would have been transformed into a ghostly scene of various shaped amorphous nebulae and dust clouds overlying one another. The entire Scorpio-Sagittarius region would have taken on an ominous appearance. Within minutes of the appearance of the blue star, superwave cosmic rays would have begun impacting the solar system's magnetic field sheath. This would have caused a network to form of faintly luminous cobweb-like filaments stretching outward from the sky from the vicinity of the blue star. Perhaps the most frightening phenomenon to occur in this early stage would be the prompt arrival of the electromagnetic pulse 
and perhaps shortly afterward, the onslaught of a giant gravity wave with its ensuing crustal torque, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. Legends from various cultures around the world describe the occurrence of terrible natural distress affecting the entire globe. The Popol Vuh of the Mayan Indians, the Dadastan Idinic, or the sacred Zoroastrian texts, the Singli Tatsu and Chao from China, the sacred Buddhist text, the Vasudhu Maga, the Bhagavata Purana text from India, the myth of Phaeton and the Sun Chariot from Greece, all speak of a similar catastrophe. While each of these is unique in its own way, they all share certain common themes. One such theme concerns a period of darkness that lasts for many generations and during which the sun, moon and stars become dim or even disappear from view behind dark clouds in the heavens. Astronomical observations indicate that our solar system is surrounded by a cloud of dust and frozen cometary debris. Normally, the solar wind keeps the solar system free of much of this dust. This outward breeze or wind of ionized hydrogen and helium, continually emitted by the sun, exerts a pressure on these dust particles, keeping them at bay. However, upon its arrival, a superwave cosmic ray volley would have countered the solar wind's expelling action and would have begun to push this cosmic dust back into the solar system. Sufficiently large amounts of this dust in the solar system could have reduced or entirely blocked light coming from the sun, moon, and the stars, accounting for the legendary references to the darkening of the sky. In several places, the Old Testament refers to a rapidly approaching attack which brings darkness. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Perhaps the Old Testament's portrayal of the Lord as an angry father who inflicts cosmic catastrophe on mankind to punish his sins originated during the last ice age when humanity endured what may have been the worst global disaster of its entire history. Several hundred years after the first appearance of the blue star, Earth observers would have become aware of lighting effects resulting from the superwave's passage through the galaxy's central bulge. Electromagnetic radiation, called synchroton radiation, emitted by the superwave's cosmic rays, would have illuminated the dense gas clouds in the galaxy's nucleus to create an oval luminous form around the blue star. This apparition would have been shaped somewhat like this infrared map image. Usually, dense clouds of dust obscure the light coming from this region. However, during its bright active phase, some light would have penetrated. This frightening spectacle may have appeared to ancient inhabitants as a gigantic punishing eye in the sky its iris would have a brilliant light emanating from its central point, the blue star. A superwave event accompanied by an illumination of this sort may have spawned ancient myths about mankind being punished by a great cosmic eye. One ancient Egyptian myth tells how Atum Re, the creator, sent his eye to inflict punishment upon an earlier race of man. In one version of the myth, the god, Atum, gathers together the gods of creation to his heavenly central palace. The god, Nun, addresses Atum Re. Let your eye be sent out to seize those who are plotting against you. Of itself, the eye is not strong enough to destroy them. Let it descend upon them as Hathor. According to this myth, the destruction of mankind was carried out by Hathor, 
the cow-headed goddess of flooding waters. Hathor's departure from Atum's heavenly palace on her mission to slay mankind would represent the superwave's ominous journey from the galactic center to wreak havoc upon the Earth. But is there any scientific proof that such a disaster has occurred? Dr. Paul Violette first pondered the idea of a galactic superwave in 1979 while studying at Portland State University, and he became determined to find an answer to the question. After discovering and decoding a hidden cipher in zodiacal symbology, he began developing a complete theory concerning the outbursts which occur at the center of the Milky Way. Dr. Le Violette knew that if a galactic superwave had begun to arrive some 15,860 years ago, it should have pushed cosmic dust into the solar system. Wondering if there was a good way to check the geological record to see if increased amounts of cosmic dust had entered the Earth's atmosphere during the last ice age, he realized that the best place to look for such evidence would be in the Earth's polar ice record. Very early on, I realized that if a cosmic ray volley had come from the direction of the galactic center, it would have had su sufficient pressure to push forward interstellar dust particles. And if uh, sufficient amounts of this dust were around the solar system, it would have been carried inward and would have entered the Earth's environment, it would have been coming on to the, in, through the Earth's atmosphere and falling uh, along with snows at that time and become imprisoned in the ice caps. And today we should find that dust, if it was uh, falling at that time, in uh, ice hundreds of meters down. Dr. Le Violette analyzed eight Greenland ice core samples that ranged from 35,000 to 73,000 years old and dated from the first half of the Ice Age. To check for this dust, uh, the best way is to look for elements like iridium and nickel, which are more abundant in extraterrestrial material. And the technique used for this is uh, neutron activation analysis. Uh, iridium particularly is a good element because it's uh, thousands of times more abundant in extraterrestrial material than in Earth material. Uh, it's like gold or platinum, very rare on Earth, but you find a large amounts in extraterrestrial material, so this was a particularly good indicator. Also, uh, ice is a particularly good place to look for the cosmic dust because you get less influx of dust from terrestrial sources like wind-blown dust. So you'd expect uh, cosmic dust to be a higher percentage. And uh, plus, uh, ice is such that your, your deposits of this dust are frozen. They're, they're not uh, perturbed by uh, geologic processes as much as you find, for example, in ocean sediments. Todd Hinckley is a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Colorado. Hinckley has examined the work of Le Violette, especially his work that involved ice core drillings. I think it's very appropriate that Paul should look to ice cores. The polar ice sheets that still cover large areas at the ends of our planet do represent a valuable repository of what has fallen onto them out of the atmosphere for a very long time, in some cases up to several hundred thousand years. Especially in the ice sheet in Greenland, the layers are discernible of the preservation that represent individual years. As we go deeper or farther back in time, these are compressed and thinner, but still we can tell exactly where we are in time because these polar ice sheets every year save and preserve a layer of ice that can be reliably located and dated. I found that six out of the eight Ice Age samples I tested contained much higher levels of iridium and nickel than current ice and snow. So I concluded that cosmic dust must have been entering the Earth's atmosphere at a much faster rate and accumulating on the Earth's surface much faster then than it does today. 
Most of the interstellar dust from this ancient event has disappeared from the solar system. Today, only faint traces of it can be seen orbiting the sun. Most of it is concentrated toward the ecliptic plane, and astronomers call this the zodiacal cloud. Astronomers have presumed that much of the dust in this portion of the zodiacal dust cloud has originated from comets and asteroids. However, they find that such sources cannot supply dust fast enough to account for all of the dust amassed in the zodiacal cloud. Data received in 1992 from the Ulysses spacecraft provided further confirmation that the dust in the zodiacal belt was actually of interstellar origin. Particle counters on board the spacecraft began picking up uh, micrometeorites coming from the direction of the galactic center. In other words, dust entering from outside the solar system. This greatly surprised the Ulysses science team because up until then they expected that most of this dust should be from uh, asteroids and comets circulating within the solar system. So this provided further confirmation for a prediction I had made in, back in the 80s. In fact, just as Dr. Le Violet had predicted, they found that this material was entering the solar system from the direction of galactic center. Consequently, the notion that interstellar cosmic dust may have entered our solar system in large amounts and affected the Earth's climate in relatively recent times has now become quite plausible. Inspired by Dr. Le Violet's Ice Age cosmic dust discoveries, researchers at other universities have begun to carry out their own polar ice studies to assess the iridium and nickel content of ancient ice. Another piece of evidence suggesting that the solar system has experienced a recent superwave event comes from the observations of the rings around the outer planets. From telescope observations, astronomers have long known that Saturn was surrounded by six concentric rings. These were presumed to consist of relatively homogeneous distributions of rock and ice. However, close-up pictures taken by Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft revealed that each of these rings consists of hundreds of thousands of fine ringlets resembling the grooves of a phonograph record. This discovery was perplexing because it was thought that Saturn's rings are millions of years old and that any irregularities sh should have by now become smoothed out, homogenized. In trying to explain why they found these intricate patternings, scientists overlooked the most obvious, which was simply that the rings are young and haven't had a chance to smooth out. As we have mentioned, numerous cultures around the world preserve legends of a vast conflagration that swept the planet long ago. These various tales of a catastrophe may be seen to have a reasonable scientific explanation when understood in the context of a galactic superwave phenomenon. There will be no warning when this, the fourth world, will be shattered by the great fire. The myths say that the fourth world will be destroyed in order for the next world, the fifth world, to begin. These are the prophecies that have been handed down from generation to generation among the Hopi. They are considered the most important prophecies of these people. The Hopi prophecies say that with the coming of Sakwasuha, the fourth world will come to an end. It is well known in astronomy that cosmic dust and gas falling onto the surface of a star will convert its acquired kinetic energy into heat at the moment of impact. In a similar fashion, large quantities of cosmic dust and gas injected into the solar system during a superwave passage and subsequently drawn onto the surface of the sun would have caused the sun to warm up. The cosmic dust cocoon surrounding the sun would also have contributed to increasing the sun's surface temperature by intercepting a portion of the sun's outgoing energy flux and reflecting it back onto the sun's surface. Both of these effects together would have caused sun's solar flare intensity to increase up to a thousand fold during a superwave event.
Cosmic dust and gas that was pushed into the solar system by a passing superwave would have caused the sun to behave as a T. Tauri star. T. Tauri stars are stars that are observed to be surrounded by a thick cloud of interstellar gas and dust that causes them to become highly luminous, to engage in continual coronal flare activity, and to become strong emitters of cosmic rays. In the case of the sun, whereas solar flares today recur anywhere from one to 10 times per year, during a superwave event, they would have been occurring so frequently that they would have been almost continuously present over the surface of the sun. During this time, the sun's luminosity would have increased up to several percent. The interstellar dust choking the solar system, together with this increased luminosity, would have produced a major warming of the Earth's climate. Tropical regions would have become unbearably hot, whereas high latitude regions would have been plagued by floods issuing from the rapidly melting ice sheets. In the legends which speak of a vast conflagration, the Ipuranas, a tribe of northwestern Brazil, relate that long ago the earth was overwhelmed by a hot flood. This occurred when the sun, personified as a cauldron of boiling water, tipped over. The Australian Aborigines have a similar myth about an old man who opened the door of the sun and caused a stream of fire to pour down upon mankind. The Eskimos claim that the waters of the Arctic Ocean became so hot that they finally evaporated. According to the Druids, the great god punished mankind for his universal wickedness by sending a virulent poison on the earth by means of a violent wind. John Major Jenkins is a researcher and scholar on the history of the Mayan Indians of Mexico. He has successfully proven in his book, Maya Cosmogenesis 2012, that they were aware of the center of the galaxy and of its importance in Earth's history. I looked into the Maya mythology, the uh, Popol Vuh, the hero twin myth, and uh, I was able to identify certain astronomical features that seemed to be important to the ancient Maya, uh, one of which is the Maya sacred tree. And uh, following some clues by Maya scholars in uh, decoding the Maya writing, um, the Maya sacred tree is the crossing point formed by the Milky Way and the ecliptic. Now this was very interesting to me because looking at star charts, I noticed that this crossing point in Sagittarius, Scorpio region, is exactly where the galactic center is located. So I started to think that the galactic center might be something that the Maya were aware of. One question that of course came up is um, how could the Maya be aware of the galactic center? I mean, we tend to uh, assume that this is something that uh, was discovered fairly recently by science with radio astronomy and so on. But uh, when, when we imagine uh, looking at the Milky Way arching across the sky, um, our Milky Way is saucer shaped and in fact there's a very bright and wide area of the Milky Way in the region of Sagittarius. And um, so I concluded um, by looking at uh, the Milky Way with uh, just the naked eye alone, one could pretty easily determine that this was an important part of the Milky Way. In fact, uh, given that the Maya mythologized the Milky Way as the great cosmic mother, it would seem a pretty uh, straightforward step to take that to the next level and see that they were looking at the galactic center as the womb or the creation place of the sky because that's pretty much what it looks like. It's very bright and very wide. Um, it's called the, the nuclear bulge. Uh, astrophysicists, astrophysicists recognize that this is the area of the Milky Way out of which everything in our galaxy, including us, has come. Moon rocks harbor considerable evidence indicating that the sun was particularly active during the last ice age. The moon has no atmosphere. As a result, uh, cosmic micrometeorites, uh, these are dust particles that are traveling very rapidly, uh, along with uh, solar flare cosmic rays, are able to reach the moon's surface unimpeded and etch permanent records of their arrival in the lunar rocks. A number of these rocks were collected on the Apollo missions and brought back for storage at the Johnson Space Center repository. 
careful microscope studies of the rocks revealed that their surfaces were literally covered with tiny micrometeorite craters whose glassy surfaces were finely etched with solar flare particle tracks. By studying these craters and their cosmic ray tracks, uh, NASA scientist Herbert Zook and his colleagues were able to construct a record of solar activity dating back over the past 16,000 years. Surprisingly, what they found was in the earliest part of this record, the solar flare tracks were accumulating 50 times faster than they are today. Uh, this dropped about five-fold by 11,000 years ago, the time the Ice Age came to a close. NASA scientist, physicist Herbert Zuck and two of his colleagues were able to construct a record of solar flare activity dating back over the past 16,000 years. What they found adds further credence to Le Violet's theories. One of the first things that scientists did when they got to the moon was look for evidence of solar activity changes in the past. And so they measured radioactive nuclei. They were created in lunar rocks from the solar protons, high energy protons from solar cosmic rays, solar flares, and eruptive prominences. And they were rather disappointed to find that the, from the aluminum 26 and manganese 53, long half-life data with averaging over a million years, that the activity looked about like it does at present. Didn't, didn't seem like solar cosmic ray activity was changing very much. But there was some carbon-14 data that indicated, yeah, you know, carbon-14 is kind of high. It has a, a short history of, a, of several thousand years. It looks like over the last 10 to 20,000 years, maybe something did happen that was increased. The solar cosmic rays, the heavy ions in the solar cosmic rays, also create damage tracks in lunar rocks. These accumulate with time. So the longer rock has been exposed on the surface, the more damage tracks it has. And we can actually etch these, measure the density of them, tell how long that rock has been there. But you need another chronometer. You need something else to measure time with. And so what I did was use meteoroid impact craters as a measurement of time. I also looked personally at spacecraft windows that were returned from space and counted impact craters on there. And you had various kinds of divots on these windows that were caused by polishing or stuff like that. But meteorite impact craters had these nice melt line pits from the hypervelocity of impact that actually remelted the glass. And I got a cratering rate from that. And the neat thing about the window glass from the spacecraft is that those pits look very much like pits on lunar rocks. So the, the comparison could be done very easily. My conclusion is that there's rather good evidence that the sun was more active possibly much more active 10 to 20,000 years ago. Indeed, the increased solar radiation flux associated would have been sufficient to cause the melting of the ice sheets. In graphing their solar flare intensity, the NASA researchers made the assumption that uh, micrometeorite cratering on the moon's surface has remained constant for the past 16,000 years. However, if cosmic dust was coming into the solar system in large amounts at the end of the Ice Age, this would have caused this peak of solar cosmic reactivity to uh, move to a more recent date, an increase in height. Most likely it would have peaked between 14 to 15,000 years ago, which coincides with a time when the Earth's climate globally was unusually warm and uh, the ice sheets were receding at an all-time high. Well, a, a prolonged period of cosmic dust and gas inflow would have uh, explained the sun's increased luminosity and flaring. And we can imagine the, that as this dust was coming in, the sun's activity was continually building up as this dust was falling to the sun, energizing the sun. The uh, corona was becoming more and more active, and the, uh, these coronal mass ejections were happening now continuously and throwing off uh, the um, balls of plasma far larger than we see today. In a matter of days, as it raced towards the Earth and Moon, this bubble of hot coronal gas and plasma would have expanded to form a dome-shaped front tens of millions of miles in diameter. Upon arriving, this uh, sphere of hot, fiery plasma would have temporarily engulfed the Earth and Moon, producing temperatures hot enough to melt dust particles on the surfaces of lunar rocks. It also would have severely disturbed the Earth's geomagnetic field. 
In fact, uh, paleomagnetic studies have shown that at that, about that time, 14,200 years ago, the Earth's magnetic pole flipped to an equatorial location. And throughout this period, the magnetic field was severely disturbed. This would have been caused by the solar flare particles getting trapped in the radiation belts and producing a magnetic field opposed to the Earth's field. Like the moon, Earth also preserves a record of rapid heating of its surface. Some of these records are the myths that are held by people from all cultures on the planet. The time from 1.8 million years ago up to about 9,600 BC, when the last ice age ended, is referred to by geologists as the Pleistocene period. A study of the fossil record reveals that at no time during the entire Pleistocene did animal extinction proceed at a more rapid pace than at the close of the last ice age. Between 13,000 and 16,000 years ago, at least 57 land mammals became extinct. The anomalous nature of this episode is apparent in this graph, which plots the rate of disappearance of large land mammals from North America over the past two million years. The rate of disappearance for small mammals, although not quite as large, was still quite significant. If this graph can be taken as an indicator of the loss of human life, we can imagine the suffering the human race was going through at that time, not just over a few years, but over many generations. This unrivaled extinction episode occurred at a time when the ice sheets were discharging meltwater at an unusually high rate. Climate profiles show that the Earth's climate was unusually warm at this time. Both occurred at a time when the sun was putting out cosmic rays at an unusual high rate. These correlations suggest that the mass extinction at the end of the Pleistocene was due to a natural hazard associated with a solar conflagration and accompanying glacial meltwater floods. In fact, if you study the fossil remains, you find that the rise of extinction rate paralleled the rise of meltwater output from the North American ice sheet. In fact, paleontologists failed to find any extinct species surviving past about 13,000 years ago. North America had the largest glacial ice sheet and studies have shown that the cataclysm was most severe there. Some 95% of the mammals became extinct. So what caused this mass extinction? The evidence from geology and mythology lead us to believe that the extreme heat of a solar conflagration combined with floods of unprecedented proportions were the principal cause. These high velocity waves would not only have drowned the mammals, but would have destroyed their food supply as well. Larger animals would have been at a distinct disadvantage since they would have required greater amounts of biomass for their survival and since they take longer for their population to increase in size. The few grazing mammals that survived this cataclysm would have either starved to death or become rapidly exterminated by their predators or by humans searching for food. As we can see today, ponds and lakes on a glacier's surface, as well as caverns within the glacier, store large quantities of meltwater. From time to time, these can suddenly release their contents and produce potentially destructive floods called glacier bursts. Both large and small animal remains have been found in these permafrost silts. Examples of large animals would be saber-toothed tiger, ground sloth, mammoth, small animals like uh, beaver, uh, squirrel. It's generally agreed that these animals died of asphyxia, as would occur in drowning. It appears that the same agent that created the Alaskan deposits also operated all across northern Siberia to form what's called the mammoth horizon. Here they found thousands of mammoths and rhinoceros preserved in these permafrost silts. It seems that whatever killed these animals caught them unawares. Uh, some people have suggested there was ice, that they broke through the ice, and at the time they were chewing their food and they were suddenly frozen. To explain uh, whole fields full of bones like this, it just becomes absurd. When you have catastrophic deposition, the heavy materials settle first, and then the lighter things. And again, here they found the rocks, the heavy rocks, and the bones 
on the on the bottom. And as they go up, they get to the finer sands and silts, and that's where they find a lot of the uh, soft tissues. So th this indicates deposition by action of water, but violent action. This is over, uh, not just over acres, we're talking about whole countries are covered with this. It, I mean, the only reason you see it frozen in Alaska, the only reason you find the soft parts uh, along with the bones in Alaska is because the, the climate there has preserved them. The idea that occurs to me is that this uh, catastrophe occurred at a time when the climate was quite warm and actually there were probably mass migrations towards the high latitude regions to get away from the heat. And uh, actually it made matters worse for them because then they, they got it from the ice sheet with these glacier waves. And if you had one of these solar conflagrations occur at that time, uh, you could imagine the animals grazing in this region because it was warmer than normal. So there was quite a lot of vegetation there and they would be eating the grass or whatever and uh, not knowing that thousands of kilometers away uh, dams on the ice sheet had broken and uh, water was coursing down the ice sheet gaining in momentum and energy. You can imagine a, a mountainous wave uh, 500 feet high, thousands kilometers long perhaps, traveling down the ice sheet and these animals wouldn't be aware of it until the thing had left the ice sheet and was thundering across the plains. And what could they do? As many as two superwaves may already have left the galactic center and speeding toward our solar system. But there is no way that we can see them coming. Since a superwave travels outward from the galactic center at the speed of light, the radiation signaling its initial emergence from the galactic core would arrive only minutes ahead of its cosmic rays. Once it arrives, a superwave's presence becomes quite a noticeable phenomenon in the heavens due to the light it beams towards us. I've suggested it's possible to set up a shield Using advanced technology, this would require technology beyond what is allowed to be in the unclassified world. Now, this is technology that's so far advanced that it's kept classified. And there's evidence that we have this because of tests that have been going on. I believe it's possible to use this technology on a much larger scale. This would require a project that would dwarf the Apollo project, the Manhattan project, and all our black projects put together, we're talking about something where we'd probably establish field transmitters on several planets in the solar system that were able to set up an energy shield outside the solar system towards the galactic center side that would be able to deflect cosmic rays around our solar system before they, they were able to reach our solar system. In this way, by deflecting the cosmic rays, it's just a very slight angle, just a few degrees. If you can get the shield out far enough, you just deflect those cosmic rays by a few degrees. And you've been able to stop, you've been able to prevent them from pushing cosmic dust into the solar system. Because once the cosmic dust is pushed into the solar system, you get all the, this whole chain of events begun. Many cultures, mythologies, and people from all around the planet believe that life in our universe moves in great cycles. Some refer to these cycles as ages or worlds. These myths tell us of a golden age, a silver age, a bronze and an iron age. The last age is called the Kali Yuga by the Hindus. And they believe that it is the age that we are in now. Myths reveal that the iron age is the most difficult age of all. Man grows dark with his technology and power. But even this age will come to an end. And if the myths and the legends of our own past are correct, a new golden age will rise out of this age. Possibly 
The Earth itself is transformed by the fire from the center of our galaxy. And the ashes from this fire will be the seeds for the world to come. This is the promise of the Golden Age. The cycles of time are like the weather. And as the seasons of the galaxy pass, everything must learn to adjust to these changes. As surely as fall turns to winter, so too will these larger cycles turn. All of nature is dependent upon the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. For this is the greatest mystery of the universe. The mysteries of the past and how our ancient fathers and mothers viewed the universe around them are only now coming to light with the work of Dr. Paul Le Violette. However, there are other researchers also currently making discoveries that not only confirm Dr. Le Violette's work, but open the promise that our ancestors knew far more about the universe and the cosmos than modern minds have ever dreamed. I'm Johanna Lambert, and thank you for watching Earth Under Fire.